Greetings. In this lecture, I'm going to be covering what high educational performing countries do and what lessons might be learned by the U.S. To begin, please take a few moments reviewing this table which shows 2012 PISA scores from Canada, Finland, Japan, Shanghai, Singapore, and the U.S. in reading, math, science, and problem solving. What I find most interesting is the last row. For the U.S., 16.8% of the variance in achievement and performance in these scores is explained by socioeconomic status and that percent of variance is higher in the U.S. than these other countries. What we can take from that number is that poverty has a larger impact on these PISA scores and in schooling in U.S. society. In looking at countries that are leading the way in education in terms of PISA scores, Shanghai, Finland, Singapore, Canada, and Japan, the U.S. could learn a lot from them. Leaders and policymakers built coherent systems of teaching and learning, focused on meaningful high-ordered learning goals, supported intensive learning among educators, built capacity within systems for developing and sharing knowledge, and tackled long-standing inequalities in access to resources in their countries. They made steady progress with a clear vision of educational improvement, often over many decades. They have done this with the guidance of strong professional ministries of education that are well informed by research and best practices and buffered to a greater extent than the U.S. from political whims. Most notably, they fund schools equitably with additional resources for those serving students most in need. They pay teachers competitively and comparably with other professional careers. Some countries even control the wages of teachers so tightly to be sure that they are on par with the wages of doctors and lawyers in their country. They invest in high quality preparation, mentoring, and professional development for teachers and leaders completely at government expense. They provide time in the school schedule for collaborative planning and ongoing professional learning to continually improve instruction. Typically 15 to 20 hours per week are devoted to this which means these other countries have larger classroom sizes than the typical American classroom, but that's a trade-off that the teachers were willing to give. They also organize a curriculum around problem solving and critical thinking skills, and they test students rarely but carefully with measures that require analysis, communication, and defense of their ideas. An action plan for the U.S based on what high-performing countries do relies on the states. The agenda for states will depend on what is politically possible, its history, what the state's strong points are, and the nature of its weak points. We need individuals and political parties that are committed to these educational plans over decades. To begin, we must design for curricular quality, clarify goals, and get public and professional consensus on those goals create world-class instructional systems and gateways with corresponding standards and exams, create logically ordered curriculum frameworks where trained teachers to teach those curricula well to all students, develop a world-class teaching force by raising standards and the selection process for entry into a clinical model of teacher education with a focus on knowledge, skills, and dispositions, move teacher education to major research universities, ensure compensation is comparable to other professions and add amounts necessary to attract capable teachers to hardship locations and specialties in shortage areas, provide an induction period with master teachers guiding them who are released from full-time teaching, construct multiple career pathways for teachers, administrators, and master teachers, and groom them with merit-based advancements with increased responsibility and compensation, explore larger class sizes to drive teacher compensation up. Teacher selectivity carries a lot of weight and is one of the few factors that differentiates PISA leaders from the rest of the pack. Design for equity by adopting a fully supported state model of school finance with additional funding going to students who need to be brought up to the high state academic standards. Offer comprehensive education open to all students with a curricular that is untracked with high expectations, 
close failing schools and distribute high performing staff to the schools most in need. And finally, design for productivity at the beginning by making sure systems are coherent and aligned, reevaluate the budget with efficiency in mind, focus on the state's school to work transition system, and share goals among states and also benchmark with top performing countries making sure that state leaders and policymakers know the policies and practices that get top results. But is this possible? In the U.S. we often hear there are too many vested interests, too deep a commitment to local control, too many teachers colleges to be shut down, too many objections from unions, too few master teachers available, and on and on. This will take hard work and sustain political leadership. These other countries committed to their educational plans for decades, despite party politics. Most world observers suggest the U.S. should follow the Canadian model of how to achieve educational success in a large geographically dispersed and culturally heterogeneous nation. We in fact most closely look like Canada than any of the other countries mentioned above. Canadian education is governed at the provincial level and there is a very limited role of the federal government in Canada. This mirrors the U.S. where the educational governance relies at the state level, although the U.S. federal government involvement in education has grown exponentially in the 21st century with no child left behind, race to the top, and common core standards. Yet polls show that a national system of education in the U.S. is very unpopular. Canada is quite diverse in terms of its immigrant background, with 250,000 immigrants entering Canada each year and almost exclusively to serve human capital needs of the country. A quarter of their student population holds a first or second generation student immigrant status, with the U.S. at 20 percent, and Canada and the U.S each have about 12% of their students with an immigrant background speaking another language at home. Canada is one of the very few countries that can boast no gap between immigrant and native students on PISA scores, although Canadian immigration looks differently than it does in the U.S. Canadian immigrants tend to be highly educated. In fact, of their workforce, nearly half of its doctorate and 40% of its master's holders immigrated from other countries so they are attracting a very selective group of workers. Areas that Canada and the U.S. differ are around values. Canadian parents are extremely supportive and involved in their children's education, particularly around literacy. Canadian children read for leisure more than anyone else in the world. The U.S. is low on this list, which is also measured by PISA. Canada has a strong welfare state with full access to a national health care system and a strong safety net for unemployment. Canada made their educational changes in stages by first making peace with the teachers unions and with the teachers by bringing them to the table and listening to what they needed to be able to do to raise student achievement. They committed to building the capacity and professional skill of their current teaching force. They increased entrance and licensure requirements for teachers. Canadian applicants to teachers' colleges are from the top 30% of all Canadian college students, creating a very competitive selection pool. They pay teachers a professionally competitive salary, with constant comparables occurring with other professional degrees, like engineers and doctors. They redesigned the school finance system to ensure equity where additional monies were provided to student populations that needed more resources like in special education or language services. And they started small and pledged broad and substantial improvement of basic skills for students in the bottom half of achievement quartiles, rather than focusing on higher ordered skills. The average passing rate on provincial exams rose from 55 to 70 percent in third grade with similar gains across grade levels. And they improved the high school graduation rate from 68 to 79 percent with all of this progress happening in about five years. Yet we do know there are great American schools that do work. Here you'll find two YouTube videos highlighting High Tech High and the Met School. 
High Tech High focuses on personalization, real world connections, and a common intellectual mission around authentic relationships, relevance, and rigor. They boast a 100% graduation and college acceptance rate, with 80% going to four year colleges and 27% receive a technical degree while in college. More than half are from first generation student backgrounds. There is a representative lottery system to gain entrance into the school, and their student operating budget per student is lower than across the state. Test scores are highest among the state. Their curriculum is based around project-based learning, and they move to the next grade by showcasing their work in a digital portfolio to a panel of teachers, students, and community members, and their graduation requirements include an internship and a senior project. The Met School also engages in personalized educational programs around what is the interest of the students. Individual learning plans are created with a teacher and students are matched with a teacher for their four years of high school to ensure their individual learning plan is met and there's a heavy emphasis on internships. They also boast nearly a 100% graduation rate and a 95% college acceptance rate. What we see in these two schools, and many who are also seen as successful in the American educational system, is that they focus on very similar areas of education. Number one, authentic learning and assessment. Number two, developing student motivation and grit. And number three, school accountability and teacher development. In closing, I have a couple of long-winded questions for you to consider. The first being, the U.S. has preoccupied their educational wisdom with applying economic logic to schooling with punitive accountability, performance pay, and competition among schools. Canadian leaders and just about all other countries who beat us in PISA scores have adopted a sociological lens of developing culture, leadership, and shared purpose in their schools. What American values would need to change for us to move to the sociological lens and is that appropriate for U.S. schooling and U.S. society? Second, many worldwide observers believe that a big part of Canada's educational success is a result of isomorphism. The concept that more powerful than regulation is the idea that different units want to look justifiably legitimate and thus will not differ much from one another. How does this play into American schooling and have American schools seen the benefits to isomorphism that Canada has. Thank you.